Now, the past week has seen the presidential candidate of the Labour Party too, Mr. Peter Obi, on the road, but this time around abroad. He has been on a tour of the United States where he's been speaking for diaspora support and addressing different segments of the audience. The Labour Party has also inaugurated an 11-man committee to steer its diaspora activities and ensure inclusiveness of the members of the party outside the country and also to get some financial support. However, there have been questions as to the foreign support the Labour Party and its candidate is getting and perhaps what the law says. Well, let's get some perspectives on the Labour Party and his, uh, uh, the activities of the presidential candidate Peter Obi in the diaspora in, uh, across the, con uh, the continent, um, across the world, seeking support and what the law says. I'm being joined by one of those spread things that has been on that trip with him. Professor Pat Utomi joins us live from New York on the sideline of one of the events that the Labour Party presidential candidate is presently speaking in New York. Professor Pat Utomi joins us from New York. Thank you so much, Prof, for joining us. Um, there has been growing criticism of your party, Labour Party, uh, on uh, is grassroots support. And perhaps why you are looking uh, to the aspora support as to seeking uh, the support locally where you could get the vote. What inspired the diaspora, uh, the seeking of the aspora support and the foreign uh, trip that you and your candidates are embarking on? Well, <clears throat> Shale, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you again, but I think that you are missing the point so completely. I can't believe that you are hitting the ball in the wrong direction. I told you that we are building a movement. It is a movement that is designed to rescue a country, not just a country, but a race. And if you are going to embark on a project to save a race, you've got to engage the stakeholders broadly. Look, the black man has faced 500 years of servitude. We saw a remarkable thing begin in the United States with freedom fighters like Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr. And we eventually saw the fruits many years later in a Barack Obama as president of the United States of America. We watched the planet evolve. In the last hundred or so years, if you look at the countries that have taken off and gone through rapid transformation, their transformation has been driven significantly by their diaspora, starting with the Meiji Restoration in Japan and how Japanese ascendancy came from the Japanese diaspora, mainly from Germany, influencing Japan's engagement with technology and a new way. We've watched India rising, we've seen China rising, and we've seen spectacular roles that have been played by their diasporas in making it happen. I can tell you uh, for a clear fact that I was in India in 1991 and 1994. Um, in 1991, India was down to less than three weeks trading money in its foreign reserves. India was technically bankrupt like Nigeria is right now. Let's not kid ourselves, Nigeria is bankrupt right now. And there was a sense of, my goodness, what's gonna to happen to almighty India? A series of things that people didn't quite anticipate. Rajiv Gandhi had been killed in that assassination. Congress in Dira Party didn't know what to do. They needed a, a, a gap closing person until the next Gandhi more or less would be ready. And Ratsima Rao became prime minister of India. Rao appointed Mama Mahon Singh, finance minister and a series of reforms began. In those reforms, the surge of new capital coming into India as we need to rebuild Nigeria came, one, from the United States, and two, from a source called NRI. I remember as a teacher at the Lagos Business School, I used to make a joke that the second biggest source of foreign investment, at that time, was growing at the rate of almost a billion a week after reaching near bankruptcy. The second biggest source, because of new policies that were 
put in place by Mao Singh was coming from NRI. And I used to joke that it was from Nri, a village in the southeast of Nigeria. And then I would make everybody laugh for a bit. And they would ponder the puzzle that I said, no, it's actually non resident Indians. So as we begin to get ready to rescue a Nigeria, it would be totally unthoughtful if we didn't engage the Nigerian diaspora because that relief for Nigeria will come from them. It is a clear way of implementing strat strategy. And so this coming and having these listening clinics with the diaspora and getting them to be hooked is like saying, you can do, look, look at globalization as a major factor in India rising. We have seen American economists, Nobel Prize winning economists, Joseph Stiglitz, first wrote the book, Globalization and its Discontents, pointing to some basic challenges of globalization. And then more recently, someone like Paul Krugman, another Nobel Prize uh, winner who supported globalization, beginning to say, wait a minute, maybe we should begin to rethink this, uh, some things in globalization. But what have we seen? The Indian economists, like Jagdish Bhagwati, have written books in praise of, of globalization. Why? Their role as academics essentially drove India's profit uh, uh, from all right, prof. Yeah, so essentially, Prof, uh, yes. if we summarize, and I, I premise the first question on the essence of the diaspora support you are seeking, because essentially, what will make your candidate be the next president is the actual vote. Whatever support you are getting uh, will amount to nothing if the votes don't come. That's why I premise my uh, first question on that. So essentially, what you are trying to do abroad is to garner a support for the agenda of the Peter Obi and Labour Party. That's it, isn't it? That is it, because you've got, if you run around, get elected, and you don't have a path to implementation, you've just wasted time getting elected. That's one. The second bit is that you underestimate what the diaspora can do. Look, a country that has collapsed like Nigeria, where its biggest source of foreign revenue, oil, is giving it far less than diaspora remittances. Nigeria is actually on a life support system held up by the diaspora. So if we get that diaspora to say to all these people who are sending money for burial, for um, uh, just basic survival, eating, for everything, look, you got to free us from this pressure by making the country work. Prof, Not like it, yeah. today in Nigeria. So, so they can uh, uh, as that them. agenda, apologies, Prof, as that agenda in secondary support, as it started working, is it going according to your plan? Or what Absolutely. perhaps is the biggest achievement you have gotten so far since over a week that you've been there? Hey, Shem, you won't believe it. We've been packing the place full. As I speak to you, Mr. Obi is downstairs talking to more than 1,500 Nigerian uh, students from Yale, Columbia, and all of those places. And we are building the new Nigerians that will go and connect up to their cousins at home and say, we got to stop this, energize them to do what Barack Obama did in the United States to empower young people to... Look, Nigeria is a young country. 70% of those who will vote are technically called youth. All these fellows who, who you're talking about that have built this, what I like to call, structures of criminality that are used for as election rigging, will find that these young people will put in place what is bigger than any structure what will reach more voters and what will shock them out of public office? And I hope they stay away from it for a very long time. All right, so prof. They win the yeah. and ruin the country. So, so I want to assure you that this is a purposeful thing. Campaigns have not started, so we're not really campaigning. We are essentially preparing people to change the structure of Nigeria's democracy. All right. So that if we change it, we can have a new country. So let's let's clarify this before I get into other issues quickly. It's uh it's a controversy that I saw, and I feel that it's needed because you are part of that tour, so you can get, uh, get cl uh, give us some clarification. Has there been any kind of uh, charges, fees, paid by any attendees of these uh, meetings with Mr. Pitobi? Have they been charged uh, any fees to attend such meetings? 
we have been invited to events. We, we don't know what the mechanics are, you know. So in America, it's a tradition. If some people give it breakfast or dinner, they may charge people to come to eat. But we have never, we've not been associated with anything. We just get invited by Nigeria groups and we attend. So uh, I don't think that that is an issue we've engaged with in any shape, form, or any ways. So another thing that we we'll probably need to lift off before we discuss uh, uh, some other proper issue is uh, that story, and I've, I'm very sure that you must have been uh, apprised about it, that there was some kind of issue between yourself and Mr. Peter Obi about campaign funding, campaign structure with the police, with the party structure. Just in a few seconds, if you touch on that, so that I can go into the next question. Yeah, that it shows you how dangerous a territory we're playing. This thing called fake news has reached a point now for example, I heard that this thing happened in Agbo, a town that I have not visited in, in, in years. I, you know, you know me very well. You know that one of the last conversations I can have with anybody and dispute around is money. Whenever there is a money issue and people are disputing, I walk away, even if I have billions to lose. I helped found a company that would become a multi-billion naira company. Once I saw unethical behavior, I just walked away. Each time I see those things, I walk away. So uh, to now come and do that over campaign, you know, you know me well enough to know that that's absolute nonsense. Uh, no such thing ever happened. We've never even had a, had a conversation around money in any shape, form. So, so let, let's talk about money now, because money uh, is a very big deal when it comes to campaign financing. And yeah. uh, because uh, we've heard that the Labour Party has been touting that they don't pay shishi. Shishi in Nigeria means uh, a dime. They're not going to pay anything that um, Peter B is a man who will not give shishi in that, in that sense. So um, are you also seeking funds, uh, I mean, sourcing finance to uh, for the campaigns of Peter B and the Labour Party from the diaspora community? When the time is right, the diaspora will give money. They have always given money to campaigns. I have run for president, as you know, uh, before. I got support from the diaspora in 2006 or seven, six and seven. Uh, and then uh, when I ran uh, into 2011, when the time is right, uh, we're going to solicit, obviously, from Nigerians across the board. We're setting up portals where people can give money. You can hear the excitement, you the shouting of these young people. Uh, uh, from downstairs, I'm actually like two floors up from where they are, we can hear the excitement. It is those young people down there that are screaming who will give from their allowances, what they earn working here, $10 every week for the season of the election. But these portals are not up yet. They will be up next week or so. And eventually we're going to um, be able to access uh, resources from the diaspora for sure. But right now what we're we are about is a sensitization to about what makes democracy work. Right now, Nigeria's democracy is not working because of the transaction costs that are involved, the trade-offs that have to be made, such that eventually when people get to power, they find that um, what trumps is power and not purpose. They forget the purpose because there are so many um, deals, IOUs, payoffs to win the election that in the end, we get the politics of politicians, for politicians, by politicians, and not a democracy that is for the people and by the people. All right. That's why is where it is today, crippled, lying prostrate before the world, in spite of its enormous potential, because Nigerian politicians are so connected to the deals that they can make for themselves, rather than the service of the people uh, in the process. Uh, prof, so let, that's what let, we're trying to change. Yeah. Let, let me jump in quickly on the issue mm. you mentioned, on the hopes of uh, sourcing funds from abroad. Uh, and I'd like to uh, probably bring uh, Section 225 of the Constitution and Section 85, Subsection A, B, C, D of the Nigerian uh, Electoral Act 2022 to your notice about the source of funding for campaign uh, and how the law uh, looks at it. Are you worried or are you aware about the, the, uh, what the law says and getting funds for party activities and campaign funding outside of Nigeria? Chair, I'm completely aware of what the law says. If we open a portal and say Nigerians who want to support what we stand for should contribute to it, if you say Nigerians abroad can't go to a portal 
and contribute a, a dollar and those at home, then you take into a point uh, uh, beyond. First of all, you've prevented them from voting. Every other small African country manages to allow diaspora to vote. Ghana, Kenya, any, any, everybody. In Nigeria, they can't vote because Nigerian politicians are afraid that because they are more clear thinking people, if they vote, they will not likely win elections. You've already done that. That has created a class warfare between Nigerians who are excluded from their democracy and those allowed because currently bad performing politicians are afraid that right thinking Nigerians abroad will vote. Now you say they can't even give 100 naira to a candidate. Are you, are, are you clear what you are saying? Do you believe yourself? Prof, I mean, it is not what I believe or it is what the law says. It's about I'm what you section, you have, section what you 2 to 5. I'm no, just I'm, telling you the truth of what you're saying. Yeah, no, you might have a problem with what the law says, but the law is what the law is. But, and, but I just want to show that, uh, that Smart ADM is proposing changing the Electoral Act. Maybe that's one of the things they should... It should yeah. be changed. So, but, but presently, because you have, you have told us tonight that you have plans to source funds from diaspora, and now they, so, they, there is a contravention. That's yeah. That's so, but, but are, you, are you worried that? Give it, give so, what, what the law says, Prof, is that such funds are going to be forfeited. If such funds are found that they are coming from outside of the outside of Nigeria, they are going to be forfeited. What ways are you and they, they, are you putting they, up I'm to shocked. ensure that they, you don't they, run far of the law? They, I am shocked that you, who watched the candidates in the PDP and APC share U.S. dollars in Nigeria and they are not in jail, that you could be saying such. I'm asking this question, Prof. Now, can there be anything more of a travesty this, this than is, that? This is not my view, Prof. I'm asking can a I, question based on what the law says. To, and this is the I law of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, not a document that I wrote, Prof. I'm just asking a question that are you okay, aware okay, okay. of so what the I law says? You're a victim of the law. You're a victim. So I won't, I won't push it to you. You're the victim of it. <laughs> <laughs> of the law. What we're saying is that we're going to have a portal and every Nigerian can go in and make their contribution. What can be more democratic than that? If there's a law that opposes that, that law is fundamentally flawed, does not deserve the name of law. Look, uh, let's talk about law. You know, there's a lovely little book written in 1850 uh, by a, a Frenchman that was titled exactly The Law. And in that book, he describes the law as something that those who have power use to essentially bully their op opponents. Um, I think that uh, Frederick Bastiat sets a stage for us to discuss what law is and what laws are making in Nigeria. Laws that are prevented, that are designed to prevent the Nigerian people from taking their country back do not have the force of legitimacy All right. and must be opposed, must be changed, must be re uh, 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 rejected, so that what we are doing, as I have said, is a movement. I told you on that seat you are sitting on, Shion, that we are building a movement that will change Nigeria. So people are rigging things together in parties to win elections. We are not looking at rigging things together for one election. We are looking at changing the lives of people permanently going forward through a movement All right, that is essentially a yeah. revolution. Yeah. of liberation for the black man. Because is, this is what happened to us. We have been allowed to become the laughing stock of the world because we have poor leadership that has come through bad elections, through abuse of democracy, and through state capture. That is the current order. All right. Prof, uh, we, we, we must hang it here. And, of the world. Yeah, but I must thank you. I literally dragged you out of that meeting downstairs uh, where you're supposed to be attending, where Mr. Peter will be speaking right now in New York. Let me allow you so that you can get back into that meeting and probably get some more support that can get some funding. Hopefully, you don't get you and your party into trouble about the funding. I assure you, we'll not get into trouble. <laughs> we love Nigeria. <laughs> We love Nigerians, and Nigeria will rise up again in spite of what they are trying to do. Yes. Thank you so much, Prof, and I wish you and your party the very best. Thank you so much God. indeed.